We have spent the last uh, three weeks in Matthew chapter 6 speaking about these acts of righteousness. And we focused on that not only is there a right way and wrong way to do the acts of righteousness, but there are acts of righteousness that Jesus uh, proclaims for the kingdom of God. And he lists the three, which are to care for the poor, to pray, and to fast. We had spent some time speaking also about how uh, prayer and fasting are not something that we may be totally comfortable with doing, may not have a whole lot of experience doing, but that for him it was a no-brainer. Duh, as you hear me say frequently, eagles fly, dolphins swim, and my people fast. I grew up in a nation where in Christianity we didn't fast. It was considered to be something that maybe was legalistic, maybe where they were trying to avoid the Catholic way of doing things, whatever it was, we just, you know, we just stayed away from fasting. But here, he doesn't say if you fast, he says when you fast. And then we also saw last week that when the Pharisees asked him why his disciples didn't fast, he said, well, that would be legalistic. No, what he said is they won't fast while I'm with them. But when I leave, they're going to miss me. And then they'll fast. And we also saw in the first century church that fasting was such a normal practice that they did it twice a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. And they particularly chose Wednesdays and Fridays so that they would not do it on the same day that the Pharisees fasted. Uh, and so uh, we, we spend some time uh, dealing with that. And so we have these three acts of righteousness in the kingdom of giving to the poor, of praying, and of fasting, and we're ready now uh, to to move on and kind of conclude this section. And I cannot think of a better uh, week for us to conclude than this week. Starting in verse 19, I would like to remind you the context is still on these issues of these acts of righteousness. The context is still there. He's bringing a conclusion now. So he says this. For this reason, oh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where th thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we take that passage of Scripture and we isolate it by itself, and we do the way kind of the way we do in the book of Proverbs, where each verse stands alone, you're going to lose a great deal of the meaning. But if you put it with the rest of his sermon, it starts to make sense. It's just very foreign to our way of thinking. And if there was an ever a time when we need our way of thinking to stop being foreign to the way God thinks and for us to start viewing the universe the way he views the universe, today is the day. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself lost and confused saying, who moved my cheese? What happened to my stuff? I woke up this morning and the world had changed. Well, friends, as I read to you in the book of Hebrews, I promise you God's kingdom has not changed. God has not changed. The problem is, is we were invested in the wrong realm. You know that there are two realms. And God Almighty created both realms. One was not an afterthought. He decided he was going to do things that way. And because he's God, he gets to choose. I don't know if you've heard the, the, the old question of why he made man first, then made Eve, because he didn't want advice on how to do it. That's what I was told. Well, in like fashion, <laughs> he made the two realms before he made us, and he didn't ask our counsel on how to do things. He made a heavenly realm, and he made an earthly realm, and Jesus comes from heaven saying, the only person that can tell you about heaven is the one who came from heaven. That's me. I have come from the heavenly realm to the earthly realm, and I have come so much into the earthly realm that I will even wear flesh. And I've come to declare some things to you. 
I've come to declare to you that our, your heavenly father, your father, has created two realms, and one is really important, and the other one not so much. And then he cautions us. Make sure that you're emotionally invested in the one that matters. A lot of people this morning are suffering loss. He told us over and over and over, do not invest in what is fading away. Or you will suffer loss. In this passage of scripture, he's not kidding when he says, after saying, after speaking about feeding and caring for the poor, and after speaking about having a real and powerful and meaningful prayer life, and after speaking about when you fast, in that context, he says, now don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where elections are lost. Well, he doesn't say that. He talks about moths and rust, but I'm in the 21st century now. Okay, Do not store... Here, where there's hanging chads. Where thieves break in and steal. Come on. Is anybody surprised that thieves break in and steal here? He said it. I'm invested in a kingdom that is t t the same today as it was yesterday. Nothing moved. We, we belong to a family. We have a father at the family who sits at the table in the morning and he tells us what he would like planted in each place and he talks to us about when to harvest. He te tells us what fences to men. We are in a family business. Nothing has changed. Some days it's cloudy on the family farm and some days it's sunshine. He even said that. He said, well, the way that my grandfather would say it, you've got to make hay while the sun's shining. Jesus talked about to his disciples. I've got to go and do these things while it's still light. Nothing's changed. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is with me. Even if the election doesn't go my way, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. There is something, I think, that we can be thankful for right now today. There are a lot of our brothers and sisters who have been enmeshed so much in society and have been so invested. And today, today they're free in many ways because society took a giant step away from them. And they can't follow and still be a believer. And so there are many believers who finally are finding themselves free for the very first time in a long time. Have any of you ever suffered loss of physical things? Have you ever had an old car in the humper bumper crash mobile? The old tin can with the steering wheel? A very valiant friend, my old blue car. It never stopped without complaining and never started when it was raining. But don't you know, together we went far. My life was bound to that old. Oldsmobile Delta 88 with the 454 engine and the four-barrel carburetor. My life was bound to it because it got about six pints per mile. <laughs> never had to change the oil because the quart never stayed in there for 2,000 miles. <laughs> and the uh, you had to stop every 100 miles or so to put the bailing to wind back up on the 
muffler to hold the muffler in place, and you didn't push too hard on the brake because your foot might go through the rusted floor. And one day, somebody stole it. <laughs> Do you know, I found I had so much free time after that. Have you ever suffered loss and found that what you lost had enslaved you? In our Lord, merciful, that he looks upon our condition and he says, you know, uh, you're starting to look like flypaper. you got all kinds of dead stuff stuck to you. I'm gonna have, let me peel some of that off. We have this amazing, beautiful opportunity this morning. Since the world has gone that way, we have this beautiful opportunity to say, hey, I wonder which way Jesus went. Let me just move over there. Let me just bring some other reality to your awareness. Let's just talk truth for a moment. By the way, none of this was planned, okay? We're way out there in the weeds now. When Jesus wrote these words, I, yesterday on the radio show, somebody asked me, they said, so, so, you know, are we going towards a one world government now? And let me just share a truth with you. When Jesus wrote these words... He lived in a one world government. Rome was it. And the church that he founded, they worshiped God and preached the gospel in a one world government with an antichrist on the throne. An emperor who said that he was God and the only God that could be worshiped was him first. And then after that, if you wanted to worship somebody, they flourished in that environment, church. I think maybe we've become snowflakes. They flourished. I was asked also this morning, so you guys are still getting together to worship? You're not? Well, you know, it might be against the law soon. It's, it was against the law for a long time. We still got together and worshipped. It's only recently that we had to have cushion chairs. Friends, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in Jesus Christ. Trust. Lean upon he says, don't store up treasures here. We're suffering loss because we have stored up treasures here. And the whole time there was a kingdom that we were supposed to be functioning in and advancing and praying over that we neglected. And so God just adjusted things a little bit. And he has the right to do that. Now, or last week, uh, I heard somebody talking about a guy and the way that he was living his life, the the way that he was loving his neighbors, the, the, the way that he worked and where his money went to and the way that he functioned. And someone said about him, they said, it's like that guy, that guy came right out of the New Testament scriptures. That should be said of all of us. Those people are coming right off the pages of the New Testament sharing the love of Jesus, living their lives out loud, being the yeast that raises the dough, the, the people who are not, who are not uh, um, compromised by the world. Let me just mention Daniel lived under an occupying force in the capital of the occupying country, and he obeyed everything that they said except he would not defile himself with what defiled, he would not worship a false god, and he would not stop praying in public. Other than that, the boy did everything by the book, by the law. Did God take care of him? Did they live in poverty? They lived in palaces, and they ended up ruling the place. 
They ran the show. And Nebuchadnezzar came to know his creator because of their unflinching testimony and because of the protection and the provision that their God gave them in the midst of difficulties. Right off, we are to be a people right off the pages of Scripture. Jesus says in the next verse, and here's where our problem is. Our point of view is the problem. The eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If you look at this world and you say, wow, this is... This is uh, this is what it's all about. I'm supposed to be born. I'm supposed to get an education. Then I'm supposed to get a good job, a nice wife or a nice husband, raise children, uh, have a 401k, retire, um, do the all-I-can-eat buffet on the cruise ships, and uh, uh, spoil my grandchildren, and then get sick and die. And that's what life is about. You've got eye problems. The Bible says that we are to be strangers here. We've got to change our eyes. We are to stand for righteousness. We are for, to fight for righteousness. We are to vote for righteousness. And then no matter what happens, we are to live and walk for the kingdom and for our King Jesus Christ. With our eyes on the prize, with our eyes at the... At, at, down there at the finish line. Does anybody think that last week was the finish line and that we've lost the race? That was not the finish line. Set your eyes on the finish line and arrive at your personal finish line, having served your Lord and having endured whatever is thrown against you all the way to the glory of your Father who's watching and cheering and going, That's my boy! I think he gets upset with the referees once in a while. But as we run for him in order to make him proud. See, if that's your point of view, everything's going to be all right. But if your eyes are on this world and, and uh, that life is about getting along here, then the whole thing is out of whack. And you're not living in reality. It sounds, I know that sounds counterintuitive. Uh, I'm living for an invisible world. Well, you're not living in reality. No, friend, <laughs> you're not. Because there is an invisible world, and it's the one that matters. Verse 24. In the same context. No one can serve two masters. Now I want to remind you of the context. He said, when you give to the poor, don't do it so that you get the respect of men because you have your reward. In fact, if you're doing that, you're in a manner of speaking, doing service so that they'll like you. In a manner of speaking, you are then a servant to them. He says, instead, do your acts of righteousness so that your Father who is in heaven, and he doesn't say who rewards in heaven, although we know that there are, but he says your Father who is in heaven will reward you. And then he says this, you can't do both. You're either going to do your stuff for the respect and honor of men, or you're going to do your stuff for the respect and honor of your Father, but you cannot do both. Here's what I love. Here's what I've just found. It's annoying, but stay with me. It's just, it just annoys me. As I humble myself before men in order to do my Father's will, when I humble myself, my Father says, well done, and he blesses me, and we have a close relationship, and then he exalts me before men and honors me before men, and I'm going, wait, that's what I was trying not to do. You can't serve two masters. And he goes, no, but I can give you from both realms. 
You cannot get from both realms, but you can certainly receive. You just want to make sure your father is the one giving it, and you're not getting it for yourself. Can't serve two masters. And he says you can not serve God and wealth. <laughs> Are you ready? Here comes the good news. For this reason, do not worry. For some of us, we suffered loss. For those who asked me, what about are we going to a one world government? They're worried. What if they say because of the pandemic, Vista Hills, you cannot meet more than 10 people. Then what are we going to do? I would like to address that right now. I don't care because today we get to come to the house of the Lord and worship. And so we're going to worship him today. And tomorrow we'll deal with whatever comes tomorrow. And we're not going to be thinking about what was last week. Today, the church is open and we are healthy and allowed to offer praise and worship to our Lord and open the scriptures. Then today, let us delight in that to its fullness and not worry about what we're going to do if, if the one world government or if the one world government of our county judge, uh, who, uh, whatever. Well, what if he does this next week? Huh? What if, what, what about, what if, what if, what if? He who led us here will lead us there. Do you think he's going to stop telling us what to do? We're, we're all going to meet at, at the backyard of Mitch's. I've already figured this out. <laughs> Put up a big front privacy fence. I already heard his daughter's been a, become a really good cook. So Now listen. Enjoy today. Live for today. Whatever you have today, give him thanks. Put it to use. Remember that your brothers and sisters throughout all of history, your, your family members, your brothers and sisters, who were baptized into the name of Jesus, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and stood and lived their time on this earth, in all of the continents, in all of the nations, in all of the continents, during all of the ages, they functioned and thrived under restrictive conditions. And we will too. For this reason, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put in it. Is not life more than food? And body more than clothing. Can I just pose that question to you? Is life more than food and clothing? Yes. And then I love this. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Now the key phrase is, are you not worth much more than they? The key phrase is, they do not work. That's not the key phrase. The key phrase is, see, because some people go, look at the birds, they don't work, Dad. So why do I have to go get a job? Well, I'll tell you what, son, if you can fly, <laughs> you can remain unemployed. <laughs> get a job. Get a job. Because you're not a bird. You're worth so much more than a bird. And if your Heavenly Father takes care of them, will He take care of you? Elaine, will your Heavenly Father take care of you? Are you absolutely sure He's going to take care of you? Is your, is your Heavenly Father going to take care of you? Yeah, and Lucina, yes. He says, And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Charles Johnson is how old is he now? Anybody know? 95. Still goes to Juarez every Thursday and Wednesday. Every Wednesday and preaches in a street church. He's 95. Goes to Juarez. And he says, how long do you want to live? 
when you're 95, you can say that. When you're 59, you might go, just one more year. But when you're 95, you're like, Lord, can you imagine the Apostle John? Really, Jesus, I'm, you know, when's the elevator coming? Keep pushing the button. <laughs> can you add an hour to your life? Well, do you want to? He says, uh, verse 28, why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. I just have to pause for a moment and remind us something. God sent his son here. And he walked among fallen and lost humanity, which was, I think, grievous to him. And he walked here. And one day when he saw a crowd of down and outers, he called his disciples to him. And he said these words to those disciples. Look at the crowd. I need you guys. I need you guys focused on what it's all about. My father sent me to them. And I'm teaching you so that I can send you to them in my Father's name. He said these words. When he says, Solomon in all glory clothed himself like whether he says, verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the first furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. Here's the way it works. When you're living in the kingdom, for the kingdom, not for yourself, but for the kingdom, when you're living in that fashion, God tells you, I want you to walk across the Sahara Desert. And you say, I'm going to need a pair of shoes. You can certainly do this. Start walking. Because before you get to the edge of the Sahara Desert, there's going to be a pair of shoes. That's how... That's how believers have always lived. The Father said, go do this. Then in that case, I'm going. If I need to sail across the open, the ocean, a ship will be there when I arrive at the port. If he tells me to walk across the Sahara Desert, here's what I found. You go saying, I just, just something to cover the bottom of my feet, a pair of sandals would be fine. And you get there, and right on the edge of the Sahara Desert is a beautiful motorcycle. <laughs> Or a camel. You're looking for shoes, and he's got something better in mind. See, don't worry if you're living in the kingdom. Now, if you're living for this world, this nation, if you're living for this life, good luck. Good luck. Uh, I, I'm told that Biden's going to take care of everything, So, but I'll, I'll say good luck. <laughs> but if you're living for the kingdom, our God has, been do, has a, a perfect track record of providing for his children on mission. And so verse 34 ends with this, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What does that say? Do not worry about tomorrow. What are we going to do about tomorrow? Deal with it when it gets here. Well, pastor, you're just not living in the real world. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's do this. Uh, let me open it up, questions and answers. About whatever, about the passage of Scripture, about how to live it, about the times, what questions do you have? Okay, next. <laughs> let me open it to this. What? Um, 
Do you know in Spanish the root for wait and hope are the same thing? Esperanza. I mean, this week, poor Jared, he asked me to pick the song, so strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. I would say, Jared, particularly because of your age, because of your youth. You wait with the Bible in your hand and praying like never before, saying, here is an opportunity for me to get closer to God than I have ever been in my life. Because in your waiting, you're preparing, you're getting ready. And when you come up off of your knees, you step up filled with the word of God, filled with the spirit of God, and you, you go crashing into this world and you start having real impact. Okay? Um, <laughs> when you, if you live in an occupied territory, you are part of the resistance. Right? You're part of the resistance. You're telling your neighbor about the hope that is in you, about your God who's taking care of you, you're, you're dealing right off of the pages of Scripture, right? What else? Yes. The prayer is that there will be, that we will be, have a government our prayer is the passage the passage of scripture says we are to pray that we will be able to live peaceful lives and then directly after that it speaks of evangelism i just i want to remind you again that jesus in the the chapter that's coming he's going to say that we are yeast we are yeast. Can you can you see the yeast? No, you can only see what it does. We're not we're not out in front. We're not leading the parade. We are we're worked through un, under under the radar. Worked through a society that is opposed to God. And so, what does God do? Well, I'm going to put Mitch here. I'm going to put Gray over here. Oh, they're going to hate this. And we'll put I'm going to put Lori over here. We'll put Jonathan over here. Oh, I'm just going to season their soup. And we live in that place in power and in might, impacting the people around us. Maybe we aren't in the driver's seat controlling the society, but we're doing the real work of impacting people for eternity. Right? What other questions? Yes, Rosalinda. Yes, I would like to put that in context also. And instead of putting it in the 21st century context that most of us grew up with, I'd like to put it in its original context. Watch. Chapter 7 is all about a man grieving over sin. And it ends with, who can help me? And God says, I'll bring Biden. And you'll get clean real quick. Because you're going to come running to me. See, all things work to the good of those, but it's not talking about the good of your 401k or the good of your... It's talking about for your righteousness. And how many of you know the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States has not been very righteous for the last 60 years? And so our God brings things about that, that, that rises up righteousness in us. Did you guys ever hear the prayer of uh, Cyrus Brown? Let me find it real quick for you, and we'll close with this. It goes like this. 
there's a lot of religious pr people at this day that we're, uh, we're talking about the best way to pray. <clears throat> the proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped upturned eyes. Oh, no, no, said Elder Snow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast close and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing towards the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Well, last year I fell into Hodgkin's well, head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a-sticking up, my head a-pinting down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. <laughs> hey, when you're in the well, things get real. We're in the well. All things work together for the good of those. The well works good. Sure helps Cyrus Brown. It'll help us. Amen? He puts all the religion aside. How do I wait? Praying <laughs> praying and fasting and taking care of the poor among us, right? All right. Anything else? Any other questions? What did you hear today? What did you hear today? Don't be anxious. But present your <laughs> petitions to him, right? <laughs> that was just an inside joke between Gray and I. Okay. What else? What else did you hear today? Worship. Very good. I didn't even say that. You heard that. God was talking to you. Worship while you wait. What else did you hear? God's got it. Yeah. Anything else? One more. He'll provide and take care of us. Yes. All right. 